Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. This is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero the J-Man Seminars, Millennial Who Talks, episode number eight. We're here with Jessica Craig. Now, Millennial Who Talks, we are changing lives and inspiring others with real stories from real estate rock stars from across the country. We're here with Jessica Craig from Arlington, Texas, the great state of Texas. How are you today, Jessica? Howdy, as we say out here. Howdy. <laughs> so why don't, why don't we just get started with, um, you know, we know where you're from, obviously, but how long have you been in business? When and how did you start? Like what, what motivated you to get started in real estate? And then what was your path to where you are today? Okay. So in 2004, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in real estate, which is basically unheard of. And especially for a residential agent. But my mom was a commercial property manager and I knew I'd wanted to be in real estate. And I assumed I'd follow her footsteps in the commercial industry. But I found out about a brokerage that was close to my home and I just felt the call to go to that, go to that brokerage. I only interviewed one. I went in, I was blown away by the beautiful pictures of Texas and their little listing presentation and said, I'll be back. Passed, graduated, got my license, went back and I got started there and I was introduced to a guy named Chris Craig and he was signed to be my mentor. So he had actually looked like made himself look like a fool in a uh, recruiting interview. And I thought this dude's going to drive me crazy. I don't want to talk to him. And then he was assigned to be my mentor. <laughs> so he had taught me sales and negotiations. I had previously only sold Girl Scout cookies. So I knew real estate didn't know sales and he, we started to build a friendship and people thought we were dating, married or engaged before any of that even happened. And so, um, then December, we took about six months. We finally had the conversation, learned that we had a larger than normal age difference and decided to give a relationship a try. And we even made an exit plan that we said that if we weren't even going to make it, if our relationship wasn't going to make it in the, um, then we both had to leave that office. So that was our first night conversation. <laughs> <laughs> he even actually went on to say, do you want kids? Because we have a 22 year age difference. And that night I said, no, I wanted a career at the time. And he said, well, give us five years. We'll see what we do. So yeah, that is totally not the typical conversation I ever had on a first date. But um, so we started dating the next night. He actually was installed to be a on the board of directors for one of the local associations. So our first date was um, installation to an association event. And we we started from there. Um, he taught me real estate and negotiations. He sometimes regrets that because now I use it against him. <laughs> <laughs> but um, fast forward till 2010 and we opened our own brokerage. So I use my degree and license and I now am the broker for the company. So what year was it that you started in real estate? 2004. I got my agent license. 2004. Okay. Now describe a little bit the cause you're the first person I've talked to and interviewed that has a bachelor's in real estate. Mm -hmm. And I saw that and I was really impressed by it. What, so is it when, when you started, along your journey in college, were you like, okay, I'm going to get my degree in real estate or did it kind of. I actually was at a different university and nine 11 happened and I kind of got a little homesick and I, to be honest with you, I got a D in calculus and they told me I passed the course. And so I was no longer impressed with that university. And <laughs> so um, I decided I wanted to come back home closer to home and university of North Texas was it's about an hour, an hour and a half wide drive. And it's also one of my mom's alma maters. So I went up there, was in the college of business. They had a degree in real estate. I'm like, well, I'm going to do it. Might as well do it now. So I jokingly say I have the world's most expensive real estate license. Um, so I just took courses would would take 180 to two hours in the state level, six weeks of classes. I took over two years. I took appraisal. I took commercial courses, um, investment courses, real estate law, apartment law, those more advanced courses. So needless to say, 
you believe in education. I do. I, it is my ultimate dream to be a trek commissioner. So that's my ultimate. When I got my license, that's like, okay, I'll be a commissioner one day. So that's the goal. So I have my brokers now. Last week I was installed to be chairman of our local association when we called the fire and ice installation. Mr. Calm, Cool and Collect moved out and Ms. Fire moved in with the fiery redhead that I am. So Wait, but is, is, is Mr. Is Mr. Ice your husband? No. Mr. Uh, Ice is the gentleman that was behind before me. He's really uh, nice and calm and you know, would just say, well, whatever you think is best, and I'll not quite the same. The fire. The fire yes. Craig, Craig is coming in. Yes. I love that. I love that. So so <clears throat> get a little get bit of it. Okay. okay, let's talk let's a little talk. bit about your first year in real estate and like what were some of your challenges being a younger person in real estate? And I would imagine a female in, in the great state of Texas. And what, what was that like? Was there any challenges there? You know, talk to us about what those challenges were and, and how, because you're, you're highly educated coming in. And I think that's, that's, not anything well, to be that asking. A challenge and I knew real estate. I didn't know sales. So Chris taught me that. Um, but everyone I knew had a real estate license. My entire sphere of influence had real estate license. So if they didn't, <laughs> if they didn't sell residential, they were in commercial. And then if you're a commercial, you think you can do residential because it's just a house in comparison to what they do. And so that was my biggest challenge. So I had to come out of a shell. I used to be in a shell and um, just and get out there and kind of build a, you know, a referral based business. So I started doing networking meetings um, and then we just kind of and, and grew, grew a nice sphere of influence from there. Yeah. I imagine that's, that's tough because they say like, start with your sphere. And if you're looking at your sphere and you're like, real estate, real estate, real estate, Right. Kind of makes they it all tough. just passed their test too. So yeah. So you, yeah, you stepped up thing. stepped outside your comfort zone and started like doing like chamber events and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I did more like meetups and that type of thing. Um okay. the, one of the interesting stories in my first year was my mom's a commercial property manager. She worked for a REIT management company. My dad had a promotional marketing company called AIM Marketing, but there's also a property management company called AIM Management. So he receives a call on a commercial property and he said, well, that's funny. My wife's a commercial property manager. You call her. She'll be able to answer your question. So they call and she says, well, that's funny. My daughter's works for Cobalt Banker at the time and that's a commercial property from Cobalt Banker. And she hanged the phone up. She never put two and two together that that was a great referral that I could have, she could have handed me because she was in property management, AKA babysitting. And so she didn't know sales <laughs> <laughs> and she had no idea. And she tells me this and I was so upset that she didn't give me the referral. I didn't have a clue on who called her. And so that was, yeah. So I learned that I now have to train people toot your own horn kind of thing. Um, I, my big line is, you know, I'm a buyer referral agent with Brian Buffini. So I'm never too busy for your referrals, exchange the information and I'll take care of the rest is my line that I like to use. Excellent. So <clears throat> what were some of the other keys to building that referral based business? Like how do you educate your referral givers to give you better referrals or, or be out on the lookout for, you on a daily basis? Like how, how did you start to build that? You know, it's just constant contact, you know, what may seem annoyance to you, but you realize other life things have happened. And so you just, you just have to stay in contact with them and just be follow up and, and ask. And then they tend to remember. So that's, that's been our key. So ask for the referral with that big key. I mean, it yeah. sounds simple, right? But I think, yeah. So many agents, especially newer agents, they, they might be intimidated to ask for that referral. And that's why they never get it. No, well, people I people think that when you're asking for the referral, you're also asking the people to move. <laughs> you know, and and you're not. You're just asking, just ask for the referral and or a suggestion, or if you keep me in mind, 
you know, then it raises the red flags in their head naturally. And so then it typically increases your opportunity to get something. So, so what are the, some of the ways that you stay top of mind, just like phone calls, emails, social media, like how do you stay top of mind with, with your clients or when you were building your sphere, like what were some of the tools that you used? It is, I'm not really big on phone calls. That's probably where my weakness is because I'm also hearing impaired. And so I, I love FaceTime. And um, so I, I typically am more just, I'm never home, never in the office, out and about talking to people, seeing people, that type of thing. So I'd have more face-to-face -face interaction. And then I am the queen of note cards. Um, I carry them in my purse for my chairmanship, for my business. I have a joke that a friend of mine, actually, she never sent me one, but so she was actually, for her Christmas gift, she wants to give me a stack of cards so she can just have them ready <laughs> <laughs> and thank me for it. She's, you know, so she invites me to her house. I'll send her a thank you card. She does, you know, just little things like that. I just, all right, I'm constantly writing thank you cards. And so it became a joke. But. Well, I, I think it's great, but, you know, and we talked about this yesterday in an interview I did yesterday, the power of the personal note with all the technology we have and the phone calls and the emails. It's so impersonal that when you actually get that in your, in your mail, first of all, it's smaller. So you might think it's an invitation to like a wedding or something like that, which for sure, but just that the, you took the time and personally hand wrote, you didn't type it, right? You wrote a personal note with something that some kind of interaction um, really makes the difference. And I think and if I, you I always, it's even better because then you didn't rewrite it, you know, to make it perfect. It has character to it. <laughs> That's good. I haven't used that. My handwriting sloppy, so it has, you know, it has a lot of character. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's say then you're, were you an immediate success? Like right off the bat, like how did you ramp up your business over? I mean, you said you started in 2004. We're talking now. Yeah, I've. 15 years in the business. I'm 15 years in the business. I mean, I, always, I think I should also be higher in sales than what I am. But my husband and I, we, I get out of sales. When we first got married, I decided I wasn't going to have two commission incomes. And we didn't need to add that stress to the mix. And so I went to work for my first prop, my first branch manager um, as her office assistant. And that's kind of where I learned some office management systems school you know tools things of that nature and then um 2008 i decided i was like well maybe i'll go into commercial and so i started working for a broker you know kind of being his shadow thinking i might be able to cross that threshold and be a woman in commercial well then 2008 happened and so that decided that that really wasn't happening in fact we had just bought our first home and we were remodeling it my husband didn't care for the texture on the wall. So from texture in, we basically remodeled this house and we did the work ourselves. And so I took a couple of months off for that and we built an Ikea kitchen. We gutted the, I mean, the floor. I mean, absolutely everything. We only hired for ACs and carpet. That was it. The rest of it we did. Um, so I did that. And then it took about a year or two off and um, decided I was going to come back and get my broker's license. And so that's when I got my broker's license. Um, and we brought it, we started building the business back up again. So that like 2010, if I'm trying to follow the right. 2009, 2010. And so now your, your husband works for you. Is that right? Yes. Okay. He's so the CFO, I'm the CEO. So. And he, I, we're okay. I mean, right, runs the house. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but what is that dynamic like? Cause I, I'm also, my wife's also a realtor. So I know husband and wife working together every day it can be a challenge. It can be mostly delightful, but it can be a challenge, right? It's a challenge because I have generational changes as well. So I want to jump on a iPhone and Google something and he wants to go look in a card catalog. You know, and I'm like, no, we ain't got time for that. But um, 
So yeah, it is a challenge. I mean, we've probably done the song and dance a little bit longer than what I typically, we were both independent agents, um, you know, getting out there and getting it done. But yeah, we've, he's CEO. I have the, I'm broker. He, we're a company's Craig Real Estate. So I said, he has a name. I have the license. Um, he will get his broker's license eventually. And um, I, he does our sales mostly. He does our buyers. I'm doing our listings now. And then we have six agents within our company and I do hands-on training with them. So okay, now <clears throat> tell everybody, cause there's people watching from all over the United States. What, what's the requirements in Texas to get your real estate license? How many hours? I believe the last I heard of, it's anywhere between 180 to 200 hours, I believe. And wow. we don't, we don't, we're not reciprocal to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you, what reciprocation means uh, some states, if you have, if you're like, like, let's say I'm licensed in New York state, I could go to another state and they would just give me a license in that state based on the education I received in New York state. New York state's only 75 hours and we've upped that from 45. So if you're a New York state licensed real estate agent watching this right now, be happy. Okay. <laughs> the, the fastest you can do it is like six weeks. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. And that's like with no sleep. Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like doing maybe one or two classes a week is my understanding. But yeah. Yeah. And then I have the double, I have the requirement of our education. We have 18 hours, I think every two years, but I, I do double that. Okay. So my husband and I do double what's required. Yeah, ours is 22 and a half every two years. Uh, but same thing, it's like if you value education, it really shouldn't, the number shouldn't matter. It's just we see something worthwhile, we go take it and, you know, we yeah. get the CE credits, but it's not why we're there for. We're there to learn something. Right. right? right. So let's talk about leadership then. At, at what point did you and what prompted you to get involved with leadership or take a leadership role? So our first branch manager was active in Grand Prairie Association of Realtors and had helped um, my husband get on the board of directors there. So in 2008, we just got married in 2007, 2008, he was president of the Grand Prairie Board Association, which is now if you're in the local, you're in Texas and you're listening to this and that's now part of Metro Tex. And, um, so I was the first lady. That was my favorite title. And I was the first lady of Grand Prairie Board of Realtors. And so he, he, he's always been in leadership. Um, he finished We let, in 2010. We moved over to the Arlington Board of Realtors. We're a large board, independent. And Arlington, in case you don't know, we're the Dash in DFW. Dallas, Fort Worth, so we're the Dash. We're dead center. 23 <laughs> miles from one the other. And um, we're a little small independent brokerage or association. And so I got that. He just finished his leadership with the natural, the MLS. Um, so he's immediate past president of that. And then last week I was installed to be chairman of our local association. And chairman at your association is like president in other associations, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Our pen to actually say president because that's what NAR has, but we're called chairmen. So. so, but you're also involved with your local YPM. Were you the founder of, and it's Young Professionals Network. Are you the founder yeah. of it? Chair one? I am one of the founding chairmen for that, for our local. So two years ago, the chairman, Tim Berry, had wanted um, to bring in local. He sees in his brokerage there's a lot of young blood and a lot of youth that we could, you know, aspire and inspire to um, be active in the association. So he really wanted to make it happen. And so lucky for him, he had two YPNers on his board and it happened to be a blonde and a redhead female. So Amy Carnell, um, a local broker, and I were put in charge to create the YPN group. So as I jokingly say, we took them six years and then they put a blonde and a redhead in charge and we got it done. <laughs> so 
getting it done, getting it done, right? right? So <laughs> I've been cheering it um, for the last two years. And I also been blessed to be able to go to the YPN um, events at NAR as well. And then we have some powerhouse YPN groups just in our local area. So and I get this question a lot for the new agents that might be watching or people who want to get involved with leadership or are asked to get involved with leadership. You know, the question always is what's in it for me because they, there's no direct paycheck. So they're like, Oh, well, I'm not getting paid to do that. What, what are some of the, you know, benefits that you've seen of being involved with leadership? When you're active within the association and your name is out there amongst other agents, when you're writing an offer and you're competing and you're familiar with you and they know how you act, it increases your chances of winning a multiple offer. That's really, I mean, so you're, you're building a network and you can really build your reputation and you can win those offers on for the, against agents who are not active and are not known. And so that's kind of been, you know, what's in it for me kind of thing. Um, it's just, it's, 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 easy. It gets, it's a give back. If you give up the servant heart, you're eventually going to get it back in return. I mean, it's, and the knowledge and know how that I get, I call our board of directors, um, the sacred table because it's in the room that is very sacred in our building. And so is it, if you're, once you're at the table, the sacred table, it is something you don't want to leave. You want to have the inside knowledge. I can go to one meeting and I can find out what our Texas real estate commission is doing. I can find out what our Texas association of realtors is doing. I can find out what the cities are doing because I, we have inside knowledge to all that. All of our politicians, we're an advocacy group for home ownership. I know what's going on. Um, and it's, it's life changing when you go to your state association or your state capital or your national capital and lobby for personal property rights. It's just an amazing experience. And it's something that um, I hate to give up in a year, but I'll do it. <laughs> well, and I think it's a, a lot of people don't realize that when you volunteer, how much we make a difference, number one, right? But it's, you're doing it because you care about the industry. It's not about the paycheck. Right. And like you said, it's a life changing experience to go to Capitol Hill or to go to your local capital and lobby on behalf. Like it's so mm -hmm. powerful and so impactful. Oh, when you're the when you're uh, in the zone, you can make the rules happen. I mean, it, it's 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 nice. It's rewarding. It's you know, it's it's not it's, it's not the evil power trips that people might think it is. It's it's it's. You can make a difference and everything has rules and guidance. And if you can set that, then you can make a difference. And like you said, you know, we're in a relationship business. Yes, we as real estate agents are competitors, but we all are colleagues at the same time. So if I'm writing an offer on your listing, like it helps to know that we you know, that I know you and I know that you're a competent agent. I know you have a bachelor's in real estate. I know that if something comes up, like you're the glue on the other side of the transaction to kind of keep it together. And it, it, it's so valuable to know, you know, when we're talking about raising the bar in the industry, right? So right. To know that we have great agents uh, that we're working with. And, and when you're involved with leadership, you get to learn and, and um, educate right. one another. I tell my, I, I have six agents that work for me and I tell them, you know, it's okay. You can tell the agents on the other side if you're fairly new to them because a seasoned agent will be more happy and willing to help you knowing that you may need some guidance. I mean, we all have code of ethics. We should be treating people fairly no matter what and not using the negotiation toy. But if I know I'm dealing with a new agent, I can answer those questions easier, give them guidance and I'm, happier about it than being frustrated going, why in the world does this person not know they need to get this done before five o'clock deadline, things of that nature. So, um, you know, upfront and honest, it's the best policy. Uh, let me ask you this. We, we talked offline before we went, you know, having married and, and you have a three-year-old boy or girl? Girl princess. Girl princess. 
princess? How do you find the balance? Because I know, I, like, I have two young kids, and like, what? Let's talk about balance, right? Being able to to be there for the important times when the three year old princess needs mama. We probably struggle with that, but she, she'd gone to appointments. I mean, it cracked me up. She was maybe a year and a half, two years old, and she'd walk up to people and shake their hand. I mean, so she'd been to plenty of events. Um, it's a struggle, but Sunday's my day with family, and I literally, it's my day with family. I feed one half of my family for lunch, and I feed the other half for dinner. I mean, it's, it's, but that's my day off, unless there's an option period. But um, it's, it's important to us. My husband and I are a team, and the fact that, you know, if one's working, then the other one has her. So we, we're understanding of the long hours, um, the ability that we need to answer phone calls at, you know, at random times. But you just had to train our family. But we know, and we, we give our family our time. You know, they call, I'll answer their phone calls. Not in a listing appointment, but it'll be directly after that. But, you know, you just have to understand that, you know, I mean, not to get into politics, but you hear on Apprentice, Donald Trump said, I he always answered the phone calls to his kids. He may be working long hours, but they never understood that he was gone because they always got their phone calls answered. And my mom did that for me when she was a commercial property manager. And so that's, that's our plan with our daughter. So when you say like, Sundays, do you just book it out? Like, what What if a client like I says, I, I don't spend properties on Sundays. So what if a client says, I want to see a house on Sunday? It's just, it's not available, right? You know from the get-go that you want, Sunday's my day off. Unless you're under contract and we have option periods um, in Texas, option periods are the only thing that can, that I will work for, or make a set an appointment for. And then you don't even get me until two o'clock in the afternoon because I go to church and then I have family lunch and two o'clock usually when I finish. And then, then I'll have a couple hours after that. I think it's important just to stress that because, you know, for new agents that might be watching, I think when you first start, it's like, Oh my gosh, I have to, whenever these people want to see a house and it's like, no, if you set that expectation up front and okay. have it in, your, in your schedule, right. People will respect that they have families too. And if, if they don't want to work with you because you want to be with your family on Sunday, then maybe that's not a client you want to take on. Refer them out to someone else. Right. Exactly. Thank you. They become a, right. It's a D if you're, if you're from the Brian Buffini school. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> refer them to somebody else. Yes. Uh, so in, in closing, if we had to look back and talk to the, the young Jessica just starting in real estate or just a new agent in general, you know, with a, the wisdom and the knowledge that you've acquired through experience and transactions and, and leadership, what kind of tips would you give to, to a new agent just starting out to not guarantee success, but the, to help them along on their journey? I tell them to shake off that fear. You really, you got to push through your fear, your wall of fear faster. Once you get past that, and know that you're going to live on the other end and no one's going to die in the process, then um, you'll get, you'll get the job done. It's, it's okay. And breathe is a number one thing. And yeah, just shake the fear. Just don't worry about it. Just do it, do it. You know, you either learn or you're, you're with the lesson or learn, you know, you're either, you'll either achieve or you'll learn something and you're both are winners. So I feel like, um, who is it? Is it Taylor Swift? Shake it off. Shake yeah. it off. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody that I just did Taylor Swift live, but I think. <laughs> so Jessica, thanks so much. Anything else you want to add here in, in closing? And we're coming to our 30 minute mark and want to be respectful. Of time frame. 30 minutes. Great. No, I, if anyone, if, you know, I, I'm more than happy to help anyone. If they want to message me, have questions or anything of that nature, I'll be more than happy to help. Um, yeah, this is my first, first, um, Facebook live experience. And I just shook off some more fears and I'll probably be on there again. Leah Brown is my, I love her. She can get on for everything. And, um, yeah, I'm, 
Well, I, I think you did a great job. Everybody, please heart do some hearts right now if you're watching live <laughs> to show her, show her some love. Um, if you are watching this or you're watching it on the replay, if you just type in the comments, Millenni Who, that's Millenni Who, you, you'll subscribe to Millenni Who Talks so that you'll know exactly when we're going to go live in the future. I'm going to tag Jessica Craig in this video so you can follow her, message her with any questions. And just like anybody that we've interviewed in the past, everybody's willing to help one another and raises all ships. That's part of why we're doing this. And, uh, you know, please tune in next time. And Jessica, thanks again for being our, our guest today. This. this is a really cool event. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Uh, and we're still broadcasting, but I have to hit the button.